Hello and welcome everybody to the 29th session that I have here with Tom Fress together, Jörg Lisman from Hour of the Truth together with Tom Fress from Inquisition Update. For the 29th time we are speaking again about the Roman Catholic Socialist Agenda and because that has so many facets that need to be looked at, we are still at the part where we go through the book of Samuel C. Gipp, an understandable history of the Bible, and we explain to you a little bit more what Westcott and Hort were all about. These two, yeah, shall, I, shall I even call them Anglicans or, or, or quote-unquote Christians, whatever they call themselves, but when we know what their true beliefs are, and we know that because of letters that were written by their sons, and then published, that is what Samuel Sigib uses, that's where he got his information from. When we know what they really followed, uh, it is so far away from Christianity, I would like to say as the East is from the West or the night is from the day. Um, those people did have all kinds of beliefs, but very little in anything that the true word of God reflects. So. Let's just say they were kind of enlightened, as they like to call themselves. And um, the problem is that what they believe, that teaching crept into um, their translation. And Westcott and Hort are responsible for the bigger part of the modern Bibles that you find today in the world. So when you are going to study the Word of God, you have to see what Bible you get because not every Bible is a Bible. Because Bible actually means Book of God. But that every Book of God is from God. There is a lot of bad influences in there and that's why we went into Hort and digested, or dissected, not, not digested, dissected him a little. And then we went into Westcott and that today is for the 29th and the next time in this that we now for the fourth time will go into Westcott and Hort. Me, that is me and my brother Tom Fress from Inquisition Update, whose picture I should have made bigger, this one, to welcome and very warm to the broadcast today on the 8th of April 2024. Hello, Tom. Hello, Jörg. Nice to be here. If my voice will cooperate, we'll, uh, we'll uh, maybe inform the listeners a bit. I'm, I'm having trouble with my voice today. Okay, we'll see how far your voice takes us to them. Uh, at least I will do the reading, so that will spare your voice already a little bit, and you just interrupt me whenever you feel appropriate uh, that you want to make a comment or want to add something to the reading that I do, as usually. So you can save your voice for the important moments, and for the rest I will mm -hmm. just carry on. Um, we last time uh, ended on page 64. Uh, 66 year uh, with a little article Westcott's Newmanism um, let me just put a picture up here of Westcott and Hort during the reading of this uh, Newmanism uh, and we already discussed up to Wilkinson but uh, because it's been a little time I just uh, go back and start the uh, paragraph all again with Dr. Westcott was also deeply devoted to John Newman or John Henry Newman yeah the Roman Catholic defector who took 150 Church of England clergymen with him when he made the change. And we, in last broadcast, went into that, uh, what kind of quote-unquote change that was and what the Anglican Church actually stands for and how that came into existence. But um, we are not going to discuss this again. Therefore, please watch the uh, video before this in the list. Um, those of his disciples who did not make the physical change to Rome made the spiritual change to Romanism, though many, like Westcott, never admitted it. In writing to his future wife in 1852, Westcott wrote, quote, Today I have again taken up Tracts for the Times and Dr. Newman. Don't tell me that he will do me harm. At least today he will, as done, has done me good, and had you been here, I should have asked you to read his solemn words to me. My purchase has already amply repaid me. I think I shall choose a volume for one of my Christmas companions. I quote, Christmas companions. So you see, Westcott was very Christian. 
This was written after Newman had defected to Rome, by the way, yeah? not when he was a quote-unquote Protestant, but when he was already a Roman Catholic, and he died being even a cardinal in the Roman Catholic Church. So then he continues and says, Wilkinson adds, quote, by voice and pen, the teaching of Newman changed in the minds of many their attitude toward the Bible. Oh, oh, I, I, I see where Westcott and Hort now got their um, motivation from. By voice and pen, the teaching of Newman changed in the minds of many their attitude toward the Bible. That's what Westcott and Hort want to do, right, Tom? By changing the word of God they changed the minds of many toward, uh, in the attitude towards the Bible because they sell to them a different word of God. Certainly. Interesting point to have a look at. Mm -hmm. Stanley shows us that the allegor allegorizing of German theology, under whose influence Newman and the leaders of the, government, uh, of the movement were, was Origen's method of allegorizing. Allegorizing, sorry. Newman contended that God never intended the Bible to teach doctrines. Yes, now that is critical. That the listeners pay attention when it says John Henry Newman, who was a convert from the from the Anglican Church, the Church of England, to the Roman Catholic Church, is now saying that God never intended for the Bible to teach man doctrine. So, if the Bible is not our doctrinal source, who is? That's the question. Who's going to establish doctrine? If it's not the Bible, where are we going to get our teaching? Now you can see why Newman converted to Roman Catholicism. He, he had no word. special affection for the Bible. The Bible was nothing important to him. The Bible was no authority to him. And he was seeking authority. And where did he find it? In the Roman Catholic Church that says that tradition is equal to the Bible. And as we know in practice, the traditions of the Roman Catholic Church far out trump the Scriptures. It's a man-made religion. It's man-made doctrine. It runs diametrically counter to the doctrines we find in the Bible. And it is anti-Christianity. It is anti-Bible. That's why Rome always burnt Bibles. And that's why Rome always burnt those who read the Bible. Now, John Henry Newman, once from the Church of England, which is just a warmed over version of the Roman Catholic Church. It's, like I said before, not a, a coat of paint that separates the two. He made this, this, this seemingly wonderful transition into Roman Catholicism, which was just, you know, stepping over a, a stone in his path. And, uh, but now you know what the object is. You've already heard, we've already told you and shown you from Westcott's own writing and Hort's own writing, that they didn't value the scriptures at all. They didn't even believe what the Bible said. They said that the, uh, the man is not redeemed from his sin, but that he should go to hell or purgatory in order to pay for his own sins. And that's what Rome teaches. That's what the Vatican has always taught. That's what Roman Catholics believe. So, uh, what we're talking about is Westcott and Hort's Romanism. They hated Christ, they hated the Bible, they hated God, and, uh, and so they saddled up with Rome. And that's what you can expect from an apostate, a false prophet, an anti-Christian like Westcott and Hort. And like John Henry Newman. All right, back to you, Yurt. This goes very well together with the time, of course, that Westcott and Hort were living, uh, because in the 19th century, that was the time of uh, uh, Bible criticism. And when you criticize the Bible, you have to give the people an alternative. 
And what's the alternative? Well, if you don't listen to God, listen to man. Or listen to the man who calls himself God here on earth. And that's what's it all about. If Newman contended that God never intended the Bible to teach doctrines, then there is only one other way or one other source that he can turn to to listen to for doctrine. If it's not God, it's man. And that directly or, leads to the Roman Catholic tradition, as you rightfully said, and we, we spoke about that tradition, uh, as probably a few of our listeners remember, or viewers remember, when we went through Romain, uh, uh, Lorraine Bettner's part of the book, Roman Catholicism, and we dissected the uh, chapter 4, I think it was, about tradition. And we made very, very clear what the difference is between the Bible on the one hand and man-made tradition on the other hand. Newman did not turn from Protestantism to Roman Catholicism. Newman turned from God to man worship. And Westcott and Hort did just the same thing. Any thoughts well, on I that? Can't argue. Well, I can't argue with that. And, uh, you know, uh, just, just, just for the record, let's get it on the record. Man who doesn't worship God and doesn't get his, uh, his doctrine and his teaching from the written word of God, he gets it from the dragon. Yeah, because and the teaching know, of man is the teaching of the dragon, yeah. Well, isn't that what Jesus said to the Pharisees? You're not of your father Abraham, you're of your father the devil. And his works you will do. He was a liar from the beginning. And uh, that's what happens when you get your doctrine from men. You don't get it from God. You get it from men. You get it from the man of sin in Rome, whose father is the devil. The dragon gave him his power and seat and great authority. And that's who Westcott and Hort sought for doctrine. That's who Newman sought for doctrine. The dragon gave him his seat and power and great authority. And uh, the Bible is relegated to the trash bin. It's honorably mentioned, but there's no power in just mentioning it. And uh, they trampled all over it. The Roman Catholic Church was born to trample on God's word. And so were Westcott and Hort. And so was John Henry Newman. So uh, it's sad that so many people... Uh, read Bibles that were corrupted by these people whose father was the devil, the dragon. They're the author of the Bibles that people read today in opposition to the pristine, preserved Word of God, the authorized King James Bible. And they'll find every, every kind of legitimate argument to downplay the, the authorized King James Bible. Do you know that if a man is going to translate the Bible, he ought to have authorization from the author of the Bible, shouldn't he? If I was, you're, you've been in the business of trans, translating works from one language to another, especially Protestant works. Mm hmm Here's a chance to maybe advise your listeners where they might find some of these works. But isn't it wonderful if you're going to translate the Bible that you get authorization from the author of the Bible before you translate it? Did Westcott and Hort get authorization from the author of the Bible to translate it? Nowhere is it recorded that they got authorization. <clears throat> but I believe the authorized King James Version is named the authorized version because it has God's authorship. And King James was authorized to translate it into the English language because English was, unlike Greek, becoming the, the, the spoken word in the world. It was Hebrew. Then it was Greek. 
then for a time maybe even Roman or Latin. But now it's England. It's English. And so far as we know, uh, it was God's providence that had the Bible translated into English, the, the, the language of the people. He put it into our hands through an authorized translation of his word. An authorized translation into the English language, which was popularly spoken in every nation. No matter where you went in the world, there were there were people who could speak English. Uh, it's the same phenomenon that we saw when when everybody spoke Greek. And uh, I think God's word was purified in the English language. And uh, we have something divine and very very special in the authorized King James version of the Bible. And there's no other Bible. No, and especially not one of Westcott and Hort's authorship that even claims authorship or, or authority from God to translate. And uh, as a matter of fact, one of the easiest ways to discover whether or not you have an authentic word of Almighty God is to look in the cover and see if there's an, uh, 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 a copyright. If there's a copyright, then the authors have claimed rights that you must pay a certain amount of money if you're going to quote that book or if you're going to copy some of that book. You have to pay a man for authorization to do so. There's no such thing in God's book. There's no such thing as a copyright in God's book. God freely gave his word to the world, okay? And uh, there's no copyright on the authorized King James Version. That's what distinguishes the King James Version. One of the very many things that distinguishes the authorized King James Version from every other perversion of the Scripture, it's not copyrighted. It's free. Praise God. Back to you, Yer. Yeah, God makes uh, the point in his work, in his, uh, in, in his book uh, himself, when he says, that you should not take away anything or add anything to the book that is written or otherwise uh, the plagues uh, will be added to you that's the way that god gives copyright to you use it right. but don't change it and newman uh, newman <laughs> westcott and Hort's business was to change it to keep as little as possible or as much as necessary and for the rest to change it and especially change the understanding that people get when they read their Bible and you know there's there's many things that can be said about a lot of Bibles and I don't want to go into that because that really is a different subject and will cost us many uh, many uh, parts to, to, to go into many many hours to go into um, there are many Bibles that have um, problems and especially these these new Bibles starting in, if I'm not mistaken, from 1871 when the uh, revised English version, uh, uh, REV or what was it called, came out. That was the first new of the of a new Bible that came out after the King James, right? I think you're talking about the Revised Standard, uh, yeah, revised ERV Standard or what, ERV or what it is called. Yeah, you know, I don't. I think 1871 or something. That was the first result of this, of these forgerized Bibles. You know, Bibles that were based on the false texts from Tischendorf, Codex Sinaiticus, um, that he found in 1844, uh, Westcott and Hort's uh, wrong interpretation of the Bible. From from that moment on, the Revised English Version or English Revised Version or whatever it's going to call there from 1871 on. We had all these Bibles, and the more of these forgerized Bibles came, the more of the original Word of God was changed in there. So, when God tells the people clearly, do not change anything, because I have had men in this world, led by the Holy Spirit, to write down my Word exactly word for word as I intended it to be written down. And then, of course, it was translated into different languages, like we have the King James today, where it was translated into English. 
but we are not to take anything away. And that is still one of the points why I love the King James so much, because it is a literal translation. And the literal translation leaves as much of the original word by word as possible. Just, you know, you, you cannot transla translate a, a, a sentence from Greek word by word into English and have the same understanding of it. You have to change this a little bit because the grammar between Greek and English is different. You have to adjust that a bit. But the King James is the only Bible that really keeps to the word by word translation as close as possible. And that's why it also speaks so much to me and I guess to Tom too. It is just the original spirit of God is preserved in every word of the King James Bible. And that is to me a very, very important point. And um, that's why I would never go to read a book, especially in a Bible, by people who say that God never intended the Bible to teach doctrines. Now, if the Bible is not about doctrines, what's it about? <clears throat> okay, let's continue. Westcott also resented criticism of the essays and reviews. Upon hearing the Bishop of Manchester deride the apostate authors of these heretical essays, Westcott wrote, quote, but his language about the essays and reviews roused my indignation beyond expression. Unquote. These are the convictions of a man greatly responsible for the destruction of Christian faith in the Greek text of the authorized version. Place Mr. Westcott next to any present fundamental preacher or educator, and he would be judged a modernist, liberal and heretic. In spite of his outstanding ability in Greek, a man of his convictions would not be welcome on the campus of any truly Christian college in America. This is not an overstatement, nor is it malicious. The Christian colleges of today hold very high standards and simply would not settle for a man of such apostate conviction, no matter how great his ability to teach a given subject. Surprising defense. It is truly amazing that a man who believed things completely contrary to the convictions of today's fundamental preachers and educators could be exalted and defended by them. Of course, I believe this is done primarily because our fundamental brethren know little of what either Dr. Westcott or Dr. Hort really believed and taught. Now let's go into Westcott's socialism. Interesting, eh, Tom, because we call this part of our reading um, the Roman Catholic Socialist Agenda. <laughs> now yeah. we go into Westcott's socialism. Yeah. Now we can see if Westcott had in his quote-unquote socialism anything that resembles Roman Catholic socialism. Let's have a look. Westcott's socialism. This does not completely describe Brook Foss Hesquart, uh, Westcott, the man. He was a devout socialist and post-millennialist. Socialism and post-millennialism go hand in hand. Post-millennialism is the belief that we shall bring in the millennial reign of Christ ourselves without Christ's help. <laughs> like in the Roman Catholic Church, they teach that we should bring our own salvation without Christ's help, right? <laughs> Through indulgences and things like that, and following the uh, sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church. We Earn all be our converted, salvation. We all be converted to Roman Catholicism, and that the Pope is our God on the earth, and, and, and then, only then, will the earth be fit for the reign of Christ. Yeah, so, we have to so. we have to prepare the way for Christ's coming back. That's right. <laughs> as, we as have, we John... have to convert everybody to Roman Catholicism, either, you know, by uh, by uh, uh, rationalism or by force, one or the other. Yeah, by content or by force. Yeah. Yep. 
You know, like, like John the Baptist path the way for Jesus Christ to come when he came the first time. Now they say it is our way to pass the world for that Jesus Christ can come back. The problem is the Jesus Christ that will then come back is not the true Jesus Christ, but a Jesus That's Christ right. that is presented to us by the futurist Roman Catholic Church of Satan. That's right. <laughs> That's what they That's don't right. tell you yet. <laughs> Socialism is usually the means of establishing that thousand-year reign of peace. A post-millennialist would see a spiritual quote-unquote coming of Christ at any great event which drew the world closer to, this, to his idea of peace. It is also easy to see why he would believe that a quote-unquote heaven was attainable down here, i.e. Westcott's statement, quote, we may reasonably hope, by patient, resolute, faithful, united endeavor, to find heaven about us here, the glory of our earthly life. Unquote. Yeah, if heaven is on earth, um, you know, then uh, also the devil doesn't exist. This is this is all kinds of these of these wrong teaching. But, in this very first sentence, I think a post-millennialist would see a spiritual coming of Christ at any great event which drew the world closer to his idea of peace. Tom, I think this is a very important uh, sentence that we should not well, just read over is. it. Because the word, how, how the word peace used here is what the Bible says when it speaks about the Antichrist. By peace, he will destroy Destroyed. many. Yes. Yeah. This is just yes. what comes up into my mind when I when I read this here. So, any great event which drew the world closer to his idea of peace. Yes. So, it's not about what God calls peace. It's about what man calls peace. And especially yes. the vicar of Christ here on earth. The vicarious Philly Day, the Pope of Rome. The biblical, historical and prophetic Antichrist. Uh, and the, the vehicle for bringing in this global quote-unquote peace is is endless wars till the world is weary of war and ready to settle for peace at any price and also this apocalyptic uh, attitude that is constantly reinforced every day of our lives you know there's the threat of war there's the threat of natural disaster there's the threat of 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 space invasion there's the threat of of, of global epidemic, uh, threat of global economic despair, uh, a, a threat of global starvation, a threat of this and that and this and that, till man has lost his will to live and will settle for peace at any price. It's this apocalyptic uh, fear-mongering that is so successful, especially among those who call themselves Christians. Uh, and and this idea, <clears throat> let me go back to the idea that you were you were focusing on before about this uh, uh, about this phony peace and how the how we've been taught through the the secular schools and the secular media and the secular world and the antichrist religions in the world that man is is basically good, okay. And, and what he needs to do is simply transcend into a global peace. Uh, unite the whole world under a single flag, under a single language, under a single currency, a single ec uh, economic system, a, a single uh, global ruler, and we'll have this great global spiritual kumbaya where we, we simply... You know, the age of Aquarius, all oh, the age of Aquarius. You know, we remember the song when we were kids talking about this global utopia where every man is, is, is the brother of every other man. And we all live in peace and harmony forever and share the world's goods and, and one thing or another. But what does the Bible say? Man will wax worse and worse and worse. It never gets better. There's nothing in the Bible that talks about transcending. There's nothing that talks about 
this this innate quote unquote goodness of man. What does the Bible teach us? That the man's heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? Okay, that's what the Bible says, and that's what that's why people like Westcott and Hort and Newman and the Roman Catholic Church and all these antichrist powers in the world have to destroy the Bible. Because it tells us the truth. And you can't have a phony global kingdom in peace of the, uh, with, with man simply transcending from a lesser being into a better being. I mean, that, that's what Freemasonry is all about, to make a good man better. But they do it without the Bible. They do it without the truth. Uh, they work their way into this transcendent uh, ascension into the, 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 the global masters. And uh, we're all supposed to follow them. They're going to bring us into a self-salvation, a, a glorious, uh, transcendent, uh, universal peace. And the Bible speaks of none of it. Absolutely none of it. It's delusion, and the Bible tells us the truth. Man is desperately wicked. Who can know it? And man will wax worse and worse and worse until Christ returns. That's the truth. Now you know why they hate the Bible so bad. Satan is, is struggling to claw and dig and scratch his way into the king of kings and lord of lords in this world and he wants us all to follow him and he wants us all to love him and obey him and transcend into this glorious peace when he's in fact the dragon and uh i i i think maybe maybe what i've said is is going to open the people's minds so they can better understand what this author is trying to tell us. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, it is, um, I think, uh, in the book of Corinthians, isn't it? Um, that um, the devil is changed into an angel of light, right? Yeah, transformed into an angel of light, and therefore his ministers, Satan has ministers. Are transformed into ministers of righteousness. They, they, they're, they're, they're behind the pulpits of the churches. Yes, this one His picture. ministers are transformed into the ministers of righteousness. In other words, they're transformed into, quote-unquote, Christian godly ministers. And they're not. No. <clears throat> they're false peer preachers, false teachers, and uh, they're anti-Christ. They seek to replace Christ. That's what they seek to do. Yeah, I think this picture speaks more than a thousand words, right? Yep. It's from Second Corinthians eleven fourteen, where it says, "And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. If he can have people think that he looks like this, what you see on the right hand of your screen, they won't be able to identify him when he appears to them looking like this." A minister of righteousness, the priest behind the pulpit, the pope on the throne in Rome. He looks so lovely, this little old man with his little boy red shoes, right? If you just knew all the symbols, you would, of course, know what hides behind the mask. And, uh, well, the, the devil has very hard been working uh, the last few hundred years to convince the world that he doesn't exist. So... If people think that Satan doesn't exist, then it is easy for him to hide behind this shiny, golden, blue background, whatever kind of boy there, who everybody would just love to embrace, right? Well, that's just what he wants. The God that is no God wants to stand in for the God that is the only true God. Okay. Let's continue. Oops, my <laughs> PDF is gone. Uh, let's continue reading. A post-millennialist would see a spiritual coming of Christ at any great event which drew the world closer to his idea of peace. This word his should actually be uh, in bold letters, I think. 
It is also easy to see why he would believe that a quote unquote heaven was attainable down here, i.e. Westcott's statement, quote, we may reasonably hope by patient, resolute, faithful, united endeavor to find heaven about us here, the glory of our earthly life. I can only comment one thing, I don't see any glory in this earthly existence here, except for that I am glorified by God when he takes me out of this world, at least in the spiritual right. way. That is the only glory that I <laughs> ever feel here in this world. These are only two small glimmers of the socialistic light which burned in Westcott's breast. If there were all of the evidence available, it would make for a weak case indeed. They are not. Dr. Westcott's pacifist nature shows early in his life. He was known as a shy, nervous, thoughtful boy while attending school. His hobbies were as follows. Quote, he used his leisure chiefly in sketching, arranging his collections of ferns, butterflies and moths, and in reading books of natural history or poetry. <laughs> Let me just analyze this. He used his leisure chiefly in sketching, arranging his collections of ferns, butterflies and moths. Butterflies. What does the butterfly exoterically, I mean, uh, in, 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 in this uh, enlightened world that, uh, of course, Westcott comes from, uh, what does the butterfly resemble? Change, huh? From a, uh, a, a butterfly stands for a new life, a change of life, yeah? From this little, uh, what, what's it, uh, maggot or whatever it is there, uh, a change into this, this butter, ca uh, caterpillar, change into the butterfly, you know. Um, that's, the, the butterfly has a very, very deep esoteric meaning. So when he already is, as, uh, as a young boy, um, sketching butterflies, that tells you already something about his spirit. I mean, if he does that because he is going into the nature and he just wants to categorize, categorize all the butterflies and things like that, that's another thing. But it doesn't say that here. He used this to uh, arranging his collections of ferns, butterflies and moth and in reading books of natural history or poetry. Okay, poetry is then again the words of man, not the word of God. Natural history, well, that is not uh, reading about nature as God created it, but um, something else. So just this butterflies is, is, is just of the stop words here that really lights up all my alarm bells uh, that I see. Well, if you start doing this, you have the transition, yeah, like today, uh, the teaching of transhumanism, you know, want to create their own quote unquote humanity, their own mankind. Yeah? Butterflies play a very interesting point in that. And in case uh, you are watching movies and you ever watched the movie uh, I Am Legend with Will Smith from, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago now, this quote-unquote zombie film about the end time of the world, butterflies were uh, having their, uh, uh, were playing a very interesting point, a very important point in that movie too. So if you ever have the chance, watch that movie. Not to entertain you, but to learn something of that. Continue, he says, he developed an interest in social reform early on. Well, there's his socialist agenda, right? He was known about his school for talking about things, quote, which very few schoolboys talk about. Points of theology, problems of morality, and the ethics of politics. His son Arthur describes him with these words, quote, As a boy, my father took keen interest in the Chartist movement and the effect then produced upon his youthful imagination by the popular presentation of the sufferings of the masses never faded. His diary shows how he deserted his meals to be present by various stirring scenes, and in particular to listen to the oratory of the great agitator, presumably Fergus O'Connor himself.
He would often in later years speak of these early impressions, which served in no small degree to keep alive his intense hatred of every form of injustice and oppression. He even later disapproved of his father's fishing excursion, because his sympathies were so entirely on the side of the fish. On one occasion, being then a little boy, he was carrying a fish basket when his father put a live fish into it, and later in life he used to declare that he would still feel the struggles of that fish against his back." Unquote. The Chartist movement, by the way, was a campaign for social reform in England from 1838 through 1848. So that is uh, almost in the same time as you have the Oxford movement from 1833 through 1845. This one paragraph reveals the temperament which should describe Westcott for the rest of his life. Quote, he was ever in favor of any social reform at any cost, as he himself stated in speaking of the French Revolution. Quote, the French Revolution has been a great object of interest. I confess to a strong sympathy with the Republicans. Their leaders, at least, have been distinguished by great zeal and sincerity. Lamartine, who I fancy you know by name, quite wins my admiration." Unquote. Now we go into Westcott's poetical influences. Westcott also was ever a lover of poetry and was deeply influenced by its message. This explains his admiration of Alphonse de Lamartine. Lamartine was a French poet whose writings helped influence the French people into revolution. Ironically, but I'm sure not coincidentally, Lamartine had studied under the Jesuits. Oh, he is a fool who thinks that the poet's pen is not a mighty weapon. Westcott's romantic attitude explains why he would make the statement that, quote, poetry is, I think, a thousand times more true than history, unquote. It also explains his susceptibility, susceptibility to the subtle romanizing influence of the poet Kebbel. Westcott had a fondness for poetry and an unusual fondness for Kebbel's poetry. No poet is mentioned more often in his writings than Kebbel. Westcott writes concerning Kebbel, quote, But I intend reading some Kebbel, which has been a great delight to me during the whole week, and perhaps that will now be better than filling you with all my dark, dark, dark gloominess. Unquote. Uh, let me assure you one thing, dark doesn't gloom. Dark is just dark and you don't see anything. Black doesn't gloom. Huh? That's, that's a contradiction in itself, isn't it, Tom? It seems to be, yeah. Uh... It seems Cabell's poetry inspired Westcott to see that the Church of England needed to make a change. I have been reading Cabell for the day, and though I do not recollect noticing the hymn particularly before, it now seems to me one of the most beautiful and especially does it apply to those feelings which so often describe to you. That general sorrow and despair which we feel when we look at the state of things around us and try to picture the results which soon must burst upon our church and country." Unquote. Westcott found time to quote Cabell to express his feelings. Quote, On these look long and well, cleansing thy sight by prayer and faith, and thou shalt know that secret spell preserves them in their living death. Unquote. That hymn of Cabell's contains very, very much. You have read it again and again now, I am sure, and understand it. Unquote. Now, I'm not that familiar with Kebbel and uh, this French guy that we've list, list here, so I'm just going to skip any comment on this, and I think Tom doesn't have to say anything about it, but the only thing that I want to say is poetry is just written out of a man's hand and is very often not inspired by God, but more inspired by the dragon. 
because also it's very much used to entertain people, you know, and to tell them things in a way that if it was written differently, they wouldn't even have a look at it. Let's go oh, into only only this I would say about poetry. It's part yeah. of the Jesuits. It's part of the Jesuits ratio studiorum, learning against learning. Yeah, it's it's a, a poetry is an art of the Jesuits. It's a it's classified under liberal arts, and it's supposed to preoccupy the minds of people who would otherwise otherwise might be reading the scriptures. Right, and uh, that's a point I was going to make about uh, Westcott. You know, and, and all of his hobbies mm -hmm. that was mentioned earlier uh, about his butterflies and moths and about natural history and one thing and another. Uh, he didn't spend any of his leisure time reading the scriptures. You can right. bet on that. Learning right. against learning, that's, Tom. Very, very good right. point. Yeah, I, I, I missed a little bit out on that. And also poetry to sustain what you just said. Uh, Shakespeare is a Jesuit invention. And Certainly. if there ever, if there ever was a English poet that everybody knows, I think it's William Shakespeare. Yeah, uh, so, that's right. And that's just the Jesuit figure. Uh, and that so slowly transforms uh, the man, the, the the appreciator of these things, into um, uh, the spiritual exercises of Ignatius Loyola, right? And and specifically, and specifically visualization. Yeah, that's what's conjured up in poetry is visualization, fantasy at first, but then that fantasy uh, slowly transitions into one's image, mental image of God, where he can fashion his own God. Use the same libertine uh, attitude in 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 his understanding of of God that he used to entertain himself with fanciful poetic imagery okay it's just a, a a very gradual way into transforming someone into the spiritual exercises of ignatius loyola namely visualization actualization and those types of things okay back to you Tom. that's a that's a very good point tom i think uh, many of the today's um writers uh People like, uh, you know, the writer of, uh, what is this, um, uh, Harry Potter and things like that, uh, especially especially Stephen King uh, is a writer who, who works on that because he has a writing style that is so visual that you envision in your imagination what you are reading. And... Then you have certain pictures in your head about the things that you read, and then you go to the movies, uh, cinema or whatever, and you watch the uh, the movie of that book. And uh, with Stephen King, there's just two ways how to look at these movies, whether you are enthusiastic because your pictures that you imagined what you when you read the book are now visualized on the big screen, or just the opposite. And that is when the director of the movie had a different view on the story that you had. So the pictures were completely different. But this visualization is also what Tom meant, because you are making up your own pictures, your own imagination, your own images of what you have been reading. And of course, in the 19th century and before, that was uh, most and all poetry. And today it is more plain just, you know, um, these uh, common books, these, um, uh, what, what is the expression for them? Uh, there's, there's novels? This, yeah, the novels and, and, and things like that. Yeah, it's, um, you have, uh, my, my English to, to today is just crazy. I, I think I'm too tired. I cannot think straight or something. Something is wrong here. <laughs> um, yeah, you have these uh, novels and, of course, you have uh, other books that, that deal with facts, factual books and and the other thing. I, I just can't. fantasy. Yeah, I, I, just, fantasy. I just can't come to the word. It's yeah. okay. It, it, it's for another time. I think, I think that you get the point that we are making here by this uh, using your natural given uh, 
visualization, these books will turn that into a certain direction. And that direction is away from the Bible. You know, I think another point how I can make, maybe explain this better is when you read the Bible, and especially when you read through the Old Testament and you read through the history of uh, the Israelites and, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, all the Judean and Israelite kings and all the stories that happened and all the things that happened with the prophets and everything else, you visualize that too, right? I mean, I do. When I read the Bible, I have some pictures before my head. I say, well, this, this must have been like this. So I, I just imagine this. But then I, I rather like to imagine things that were written by the word of God, in the Word of God than something that was written by a novelist, uh, uh, like in Harry Potter or Stephen King books or whatever, just to entertain me and, and use my imagination for that. I uh, rather use my imagination than for the Holy Bible and reading the Holy Bible. And that's exactly the point that Tom wanted to make um, when he said, uh, learning against learning. Take your time and attention away from the Word of God and put it in anything else. Trivial! That, I think, was the word I was looking for. Uh, trivial literary, uh, liter uh, literal works. That is, the things like these novels and all that. It's, uh, it's something that you should not busy yourselves with because it just takes away the time that you should better spend with the Word of God. And I think this is just what we, uh, oops, what we read here in uh, the Westcott and Hort statement about. Like focusing everyone's endeavors upon worthless enterprises, yeah, worthless en endeavors, worthless uh, study, and uh, you know it's uh, time wasters. Leads to nothing but petition. Yeah, takes you away from the truth. Yeah, it's preoccupation with worthlessness. So Westcott's Romanism. That Kebel formed in Westcott a passive attitude toward Christianity's arch enemy, Rome, is evident by his reaction to a sermon condemning popery. Quote, As for Mr. Oldham's meetings, I think they are not good in their tendency, and nothing can be so bad as making them the vehicle of controversy. What an exquisitely beautiful verse is that of Kebel's, and yearns not her parental heart, etc. We seem now to have lost all sense of piety and bitterness and ill-feeling. Should not our arm against Rome be prayer and not speeches, the efforts of our inmost heart and not the display of secular reason? It has often been stated that you are what you read. I know the statement, you are what you eat, but okay, <laughs> you are what you read. Westcott's constant exposure to pro-Roman influences set a pattern for this thinking, even though he may not have been aware of it. Westcott even refused to abandon Kebel as his writings became more obviously popish. Quote, Kebel has lately published some sermons in which, as well as in a preference on the position of churchmen, I am afraid he will offend many. I can in some measure sympathize with him. Remembering the hatred Westcott had for what he considered injustice and oppression, and his submission to the programming poetry of Kebel, we find him slipping farther away from a truly biblical stand after hearing another pro-Roman speaker, Maurice. Quote, See Maurice's new lectures, with a preface on development written apparently with marvellous candour and fairness, and free from all controversial bitterness. He makes a remark, which I have often written and said, that the danger of our church is from atheism, not Romanism. What a striking picture is that he quotes from Newman of the present aspect of the Roman church as despised, rejected, persecuted in public opinion." Unquote. <laughs> the Roman Church persecuted in public opinion? 
Well, Tom, wouldn't that be great for the day that we live in today, that the Roman Catholic Church were persecuted in public opinion because of the pedophile worldwide priest agenda that is popping up everywhere around the world and all the other kinds of scandals, the financial scandals and uh, other sexual scandals and all that stuff they have. But I don't see a persecution in public opinion of the Roman Catholic Church. How do you see that? Well, I see there being a segment of society that is very much preoccupied in uh, exposing the pedophilia of the priest to corruption of the Roman Catholic Church, but they get no press. The mainstream media and those uh, who, uh, who inform the public uh, go out of their way to avoid any discussion about the, uh, about the priests and when when uh, when uh, discussion of these things are unavoidable, uh, they water it down instead of calling it priest pedophilia, uh, they call it uh, you know priestly corruption or priest abuse or some kind of vanilla term and isolated them, incidents. Yeah, and and make them look like isolated incidents, and uh, or they either they. Either that or they place this aura upon it as if it is a subject it is a subject that has worn itself out. People are tired of hearing about it. Uh, look, when someone seems to be uh, a minimizer of the importance of the priest pedophilia, when someone seems to, you know, oh, you just want to attack the Roman Catholic Church, you just want to uh, impoverish the church. This is not an attack on on the priest. This is an attack on the church. You try to change the subject and try to shift the focus away from the pedophilia of the priest. I asked him, well, then you must not be a woman or a mother. And that generally gets silence. Uh, because a woman and a mother would be supremely interested in uh, stopping this debauchery of the young sons and daughters of Roman Catholics around the world. No, it's not just the United States. It's not just Ireland. It's not just France. It's every country in the world where Roman Catholicism exists. That includes China. This is a global pedophile priest pandemic. And the world seems to be more preoccupied with 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 uh, uh, the, the 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 child trafficker uh, that supposedly killed himself in a prison in New York City, uh, Jeffrey. Uh, I can't even say his last name. Yeah, and, uh, I, I know who you Ghislaine, mean. I Ghislaine Maxwell and 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 Ghislaine Maxwell and uh, uh, Jeffrey. Uh, I can't say his last name. But they're, they're, they, they get press, even now, still. And uh, the world wants justice. They want the list of the, of the presidents and governors and, and senators and congressmen that were friends of Jeffrey Epstein and, and who may have partaken in some of his child prostitutes. And there's all kinds of interest in exposing uh, who's involved in that and who are the victims of that. And who ought to be sued? And whose, uh, you know, money ought to be confiscated for the victims and one thing and another? It's just all a distraction against the global pedophile priest pandemic, and it all works to it all works in Rome's favor, and it really is frustrating to me. I mean, they care more. Uh, not that, not that Jeffrey Epstein was any less than a than a pedophile himself, uh, worthy of the worst kind of punishment. Why the world is so uh, would, would rather distract everybody from the pedophile priest pandemic, the global pedophile priest pandemic, and put it on one one small operation out east, and not at all to minimize what Jeffrey Epstein stood for, what he was all about, and how many kids he debauched. I don't want to take anything away from that. 
but it has taken the limelight away from the the global pedophile priest pandemic, and uh, and it's Roman Catholics, believe it or not, it's Roman Catholics who want to shift the focus away from Rome. <clears throat> it's just. It's just unbelievable. Well, I, I think, Tom, uh, to, to sum this all up, uh, the Roman Catholic Church cannot be persecuted by public opinion because public opinion is made by media. And all media is controlled by the Roman Catholic Church, as we know so, of the uh, papal encyclicals Miranda Prosus and Intermirifica. So when the Roman Catholic Church claims for itself to own all media, and that is radio, television, movies, uh, all kinds of broadcasting, all internet, social media and all that stuff, newspapers, magazines, you name it. It's quote-unquote media. The Roman Catholic Church has a birthright to own all this. And this is what they wrote in uh, the very first words of uh, the encyclical Intermerifica. Then you know why the public opinion can never turn against the Roman Catholic Church. Because it is That's the right. Roman Catholic Church that makes public opinion. And That's they right. will not produce public opinion to turn against them. They guide and direct the public discourse. They guide and direct the public discourse. Whatever we talk about is guided and directed by the Roman Catholic controlled press. And we, we talk about whatever they make popular. And uh, they're not going to focus on the pedophile priest pandemic, the global pedophile priest pandemic. Look, 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 if we were all in our right minds, <laughs> If we hadn't been Romanized, if we hadn't been futurized, the world would be out to stop Romanism wherever it's found. It's already proven itself to be a global criminal enterprise. It has proven itself to be irreformable. Remember the Reformation? It did not reform the Roman Catholic Church. They simply were forced to come out of the Roman Catholic Church and leave Rome the way it is because it's irreformable. That's what Martin Luther had to realize before his dying day. While his original intent was to reform the Roman Catholic Church, by the time he died, he had to know, even from Scripture, to prove that Rome is irreformable. She is what she is, and she'll remain what she is until Christ comes to destroy her. And uh, it, so it's an irreformable, global, criminal enterprise whose na middle name is Inquisition, Crusade, Massacres, Genocide, World Wars, holocausts, and every other human horror. That is the Roman Catholic Church. And people dare to call it Christianity. The world is, is absolutely insane. And uh, if we were in our minds, there'd be a global outcry to stop Romanism everywhere. Okay, look, the Bible says, reward her even as she rewarded you. In the cup that she has filled, fill to her double. Okay, there's a judgment coming upon the Roman Catholic Church, the likes of which the world has never seen, but not until after she has deceived the whole world. And that there isn't a global outcry to stop this Roman horror once and for all. It's just a, tens a testament, proof positive, that the whole world has been deceived. If there were a global system of pedophilia among Freemasons, well, there'd be a global outcry, wouldn't there? 
As a matter of fact, in the early part of the, uh, the history of this country, there was an anti-Masonic party, a political party that was going to outlaw Freemasonry in this country. Imagine the same sort of thing happening to the Roman Catholic Church. Despite the fact that any objective mind can't see the Roman Catholic Church for anything but what it is, a global criminal enterprise. And I call it the synagogue of Satan. I call it the home and the house of the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist. He is anti-Christ. He is dedicated to the destruction of God's heritage, mankind. That is a biblical look at the Roman Catholic Church. That is a biblical, scriptural, and prophetic attitude toward the Roman Catholic Church. And how far the world is from it. They want to make excuses for her. They want to minimize her crimes. They want to cover up her crimes. They want to change the subject. They want to talk about it in ulterior terms so it's to, so as to make it sound more palatable but Christ knows the truth the judge of all heaven and earth knows the truth and what does it say of him when he speaks of her he says God hath remembered her sins he has not forgiven her sins he has not forgotten her sins he has remembered her sins. And that's the sins for which she will be judged and punished for the whole world to see. Do fill to, in the cup that she hath filled, fill to her double. The Bible talks about fire. There's a judgment coming to the Roman Catholic Church. And uh, the kings of the earth who now rule and reign with her and give their power and strength to the Roman Catholic Church are eventually going to turn against her. And uh, God hasten the day. Back to you, Yurt. Absolutely, Tom. Very, very good point. Let's continue until the end of this part of the book. It says... This constant barrage of Romanizing influences caused Westcott to incorporate many Roman Catholic practices into his thinking. <clears throat> In February of 1849, he decided to investigate two favorite subjects of the Romanizers. Inspiration, Apostolical Succession. May I inquire on all these topics with simple sincerity, seeking only the truth. The result of the first study led to Westcott's believing the Bible to be absolutely true, but he refused to call it infallible. My dear heart, I am glad to have seen both your note and Lightfoot's glad to, uh, glad to that we have had such an opportunity of openly speaking. For I too must disclaim setting forth infallibility in the front of my convictions. All I hold is that the more I learn, the more I am convinced that fresh doubts come from my own ignorance, and that at present I find the presumption in favor of the absolute truth. I reject the word infallibility of Holy Scripture overwhelming. Does he also reject the word infallibility in terms of the Pope when he speaks ex cathedra? Our good, our good bishop has now lost the conviction that scripture is infallible. Uh, does he speak of the Pope here, our good bishop? <laughs> we are never told the, the, the result of his study of the Roman Catholic teaching of apostolic succession. Well, maybe instead of... Uh, talking of the Pope, when he mentions a good bishop, he speaks of uh, John Henry Newman, who at, at the time, of course, was a bishop, right? Uh, very interesting what we read so far, and of course, very interesting that he said, I reject the word infallibility of Holy Scripture overwhelming. So, Holy Scripture is not infallible, but the Pope is 
Maybe, Tom, that is something we delve into next week when we come together and speak of Westcott and Hort again in this and see what he really meant because then it goes on to speak about Westcott's iconism. Um, I found it a very interesting reading and study today. Very many interesting points came up, especially this Epstein. Uh, I, I always called it from the beginning. It was just a, a diversion to yeah, divert, distraction. Yep. A, a distraction, yeah, to, di to distract the people from the truth that the Roman Catholic pedophile priest uh, pandemic is global and everywhere and not just situated in New York with this Epstein case there and Pizzagate and, and, and all these things. As bad as they are, as Tom, I don't take anything away of the atrocities and, and, and the cruelty uh, and everything that was taken, that, that, that happened there. That's, that's not the point. But the point is that public opinion was directed away from the true culprit, the Roman Catholic Church, and the spotlight was put on a few single isolated incidents, just that we do not see the whole big picture. A little bit like in the movie Spotlight from the Boston Globe, which started out very promising but when you look at the story, and that's a true story that happened uh, really in this world, but when, when, when you see what happened afterwards from that, a few priests were just put into another uh, parish. And that's it. And that's how it always was. And that's how it always will be. There's nothing we can do to change it. As Tom correctly said, only Jesus Christ can and will destroy that church system when he comes back. Until then, the only thing we can do is cry out from our watch post, fire, 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 come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, because God has remembered her iniquities. Your final thoughts, Tom only to reiterate what you just said and it's not necessary okay good so then i will leave this for today for this recording and uh, we'll see you next time in the meantime please read and study your bible don't fall into the jesuitical teaching of learning against learning by reading trivial books but study the true Word of God, the 1611 authorized version of the King James Bible. Until then, Shalom, Maranatha.